you're producing world-class wines, there are literally hundreds of decisions you have to make before the final product is ever consumed. Many of those, in fact, the most important are often, what do you do in the vineyard? Tonight, we consult none other than world-class winemaker himself and globetrotter Nick Goldschmidt from New Zealand. I don't mean from New Zealand. Yes, he's from New Zealand, but literally he talks to us from New Zealand where it's 12 o'clock tomorrow. It's crazy, I know. I promise you will laugh and learn and laugh again. Let's get started. This is, uh, we have a little programming note this evening, three sponsors backed out. So tonight's episode is gonna be without commercials. And many of you are gonna wonder how we can do that for an hour, two words, Nick Goldschmidt. That's how we do it without commercials. And. We are actually coming up on episode 100. This is SIP episode 94. And coming up on 100, we've got some special, special things planned for you, including pony rides. So there'll be paramutual wagering. Uh, I don't know how we're going to pull that off, but it should be good. I want to talk to the folks that have not actually been here. I see a couple of new names. Uh, those of you that haven't been here before, we when we open up two bottles like we are tonight, uh, two fantastic bottles. We call it the Scotland, uh, named after, I can't say his last name. Hey, Laurie, good to see you. Scotland P, Scotland K. I see Laurie's last name, so I was looking at Laurie's last name. Nick, I got in trouble for using last names, apparently. You're not allowed to do that. That's a, apparently some sort of trademark thing or something. I don't know. Uh, but the law came knocking and we stopped doing that. So, all right. So how are these folks drinking this wine ahead of time? By the way, my name is Martin Cody with Cellar Angels, co-founder, founded the company 12 years ago to help get small limited production wineries into the hands of consumers all over the United States. And perfect example is this evening because there's very few individuals that have made wine in as many places as Nick Goldschmidt. And we are fortunate to be able to have some of his wine in our hands this evening. And how did folks do that? They were able to, let me pull that up in a second, excuse my reach. They were able to kindly grab a SIP kit. So the SIP kit is on the Cellar Angels website. It has four, sometimes five wines, and you can purchase a SIP kit. And for the next four Fridays, we bring the winemaker live to you. These two wines, Goldschmidt Vineyards, Singing Tree Reserve, Dutton Ranch Chardonnay, and the Forefathers. And we're going to get into this in a second because Nick Goldschmidt produces both of these the sip kit ranges from 240 or so to 300, dependent upon the wines. But this is a perfect opportunity in the intimacy of your own home, your lanai. We had some people last year tune in from their boat. So that's perfectly acceptable to just learn what it is about these wines, the individuals crafting them, the region that they come from that makes them so darn special. Nick doesn't make a lot of mass production wines. This, I think the Lone Tree has uh, 350 case production. These are small production wines. Uh, but Nick is famed for working single vineyard sites for a long, long time. And there's really no one that I want to talk to more about vineyard techniques than Nick Goldschmidt. So I'm going to raise a glass to him, who this evening is coming to us from New Zealand, where it's currently noon tomorrow. <laughs> you want to know about the NFL draft? We've already done it over here. <laughs> That's exactly right. And for those of you watching Ozark or NBA basketball, you're missing out. Uh, <laughs> overrated so you're in new zealand and it's your home sort of i mean you were born and raised so i want to educate people on the nick journey how, how did nick matriculate go to university you know come into wine when did you leave new zealand how old were you give us that backstory well it's, it's um a very convoluted story i i say yeah i'm from new zealand i uh, but um I, I was supposed to be a civil engineer. I went to Christchurch, which is about um, two hours south by plane from here, and uh, did civil engineering. Didn't really walked into the office of my father's first day of work, and I go, I don't want to be an engineer. So I went back to Lincoln and did horticulture. Today, Lincoln is a big university that is five universities in New Zealand, and that one does viticulture. But at the time, there was no viticulture. But I was lucky enough to meet Danny Schuster and Dr. David Jackson two of the preeminent uh, vineyard people in New Zealand at the time, and they encouraged me to do horticulture. That was 1982. I made the first wines for Lincoln in 82. Went to Australia, 
did a de- uh, degree in viticulture in 83, 4, 5, postgraduate in enology in 86. And um, after working at two or three famous wineries between New Zealand and Australia, I ended up in uh, California in 1990 as winemaker. Look, I was named winemaker at Simi Winery in 91. Let me, so you decide you don't want to be a civil, civil engineer. And it seems like civil engineer to horticulture is a massive leap. So how did the, did you like wine at the time? Did, I mean, that's a big chasm. No, I was interested in the technologies more than anything. So, and even today, uh, I told you earlier, I have seven patents for machine. I also have an engineering business today that I'm very interested in developing products for, you know, recycling this past say, but I'm interested in developing things for reusing. And so I've developed a number of machines for reusing. And when it came to horticulture, how engineering crosses over to horticulture, I wanted to be, believe it or not, I was going to be a garlic, a row cropper. I wanted to row crop garlic, corn, carrots, things that I could row crop. And I was interested in the technology at the time for how to mechanize uh, machinery so that we could we could mechanically harvest. And, you know, obviously that translates today into what we do in vineyards as well. And the technology today in vineyards I consider to be at a cusp. We're really evolving the way that we farm. Obviously, we we you know I've been done away with glycosides now for five years, so I haven't used Roundup for five years, and but it's going to be eliminated from California in the next three. So how do we control weeds, which is the big one, and it was the same thing in horticulture back then too. Interesting. So you've almost seen it going full, full circle with regards to getting into horticulture. And I, I love the elimination of glyphosates and Roundup. That's incredible. I want to talk a little bit more about that when we start getting into the vineyard stuff. But so then you come to the United States and were you intent on coming to California for the wine or was there something else to do there? <laughs> I actually came into California the first time in 1989 and worked for a little winery called Carneros Creek making Pinot Noir and Chardonnay because every it's funny how every winemaker has this thing about hand-on winemaking and it, it doesn't get more hands-on than Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And then getting the job at Simi, obviously we didn't make, uh, we made a lot of Chardonnay, but we're primarily a Bordeaux house as, as the evolution went. But applying some of those hands-on techniques for Pinot Noir is what I did with Cabernet. And uh, so I worked for LVMH um, from 1990 to 1999 because LVMH owned Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, owned Simi at the time. And I was very fortunate. They gave me a huge break and allowed me to move around the world amongst the wineries that they owned and make blends for the U.S. So, and I took that and went with me to uh, when we went to Constellation, see me was sold to Constellation. So I was the head winemaker for a very small piece of Constellation at the time called Icon Estates, which included six other wineries. I left Simi and then I went to the largest company in the world called Allo de Mec. We owned 150 wineries in seven countries. I looked after 58 of those wineries. So I lived on an airplane for seven years. And in 2008, um, Allo de Mec uh, basically closed down via Jim Beam, via Constellation. I was offered my corporate job back in 2008 and decided to go out on my own. If I could, if I could make it through the 2008-2009 economic situation that we had in the world then i knew i could make it and i was a little bit old i you know i was 47 at the time i should have gone out on my own when i was about 44 but uh you know it seemed to work out and and today i consult still in uh, six countries and we own vineyards in four countries but obviously my my main uh business is is making goldschmidt vineyards wines which you'll try a couple of tonight that's an incredibly fascinating career. And, and what I love about it is the exposure you got to so many fantastic wineries around the world. But also what I love about it is, it is your passion for education. And I encourage everyone to follow Goldschmidt Vineyards on Instagram. Uh, yeah, it's Goldschmidt underscore Vineyards on Instagram. I try to put up an educational video three times a week. And we're going to watch some of them this evening uh, because th- these are, yes, sir. These are they're, they're perfect little 45 second vignettes minute, you know, 55 seconds. They aren't long. So, but yeah. Nick gets right to the point and talks specifically about something in the vineyard. And as it relates to kind of vineyard farming practices, now we've had a whole bunch of educational things on the SIP wine tasting education series from 
rootstock selection, from varietal selection, from vineyard selection, but we haven't done anything on after that is done, some of the different farming techniques, some of the different aspects you can do as far as row orientation, the, uh, you and I talked in preparing for this kind of the machinery, which you just mentioned, uh, with disking, with spade, you know, all of that type of stuff. So I'm curious with your background and as it relates to farming techniques, is it a monotony of, okay, it's, it's old and you've done it a thousand times and it's not refreshing or is it new? You know what I mean? It's like, you've done it so many times. How do you, how do you stay so passionate about it? Because people, when you look at his videos, he will routinely say, I love my job. Look, it's, it's funny, Martin, you just hit it right on the head. I mean, old new, new news is old news. It's like, um, when I first started making wine in California, in New Zealand, we were making wine in concrete tanks. And today, concrete tanks are like the hip thing. Well, we, damn, I mean, we were making wine in concrete tanks 35 years ago. We were using native yeast 40 years ago. We were using large wood barrels, you know, when I first started my career. And now all these things are cool because these young winemakers, well, you know, I, I'm educating a lot of the young winemakers too, but yeah, everything's come full circle. But it, I don't know, man, it's like more and more hands off. The more we got involved in the vineyard, now the more we're moving away from the vineyard. And a lot of it's to do with, I think, because of, you know, global uncertainty. We talk call it global warming. I call it global uncertainty because who would have thought we'd had, you know, three La Niñas in a row. We're heading into another La Niña, which is a wet year. but it does. It seems to miss California. Uh, it means we're going to get a lot more sta storms in Alabama, and and we'll see. But you know, we have to react to long term forecasting, the long term shortages. Obviously, water is going to be a really big issue. So is fertilizer, as opposed to compost. We can all compost, but we can't fertilize. And so yields are going to go down. Costs are going to go up, which is exactly what we saw back in the early nineties um, when we had. Uh, devastating weather patterns you know we had a lot of rot i mean 1989 man we hardly picked a thing because of the botrytis so i don't know it's it, it it's really cool martin i mean but we are when i left see me they gave me a little plaque i should keep it with me and it said uh, we may not have answered all the questions we set out to do but we're confused at a higher level and that, and that's kind of what i've always thought about wine i i i, I I, there's always something else that I'm really interested in and um, and I've got to keep moving. I've got to keep striving and I've got to keep alive. And, and the more I can do uh, in my brain, the less I have to do in the vineyard and the better, the, you know, we're just better off being hands off as much as possible. And so this is where a lot of the old, the old ideas are coming back, you know, completely interesting and agree. And you hear, phrases like min minimalist winemaking or minimal intervention, let the vineyard do the talking and that sort of stuff. I would imagine as a younger winemaker, that takes great restraint, might take great restraint as an older winemaker too. And, but you've got the wisdom and patience and understanding to know, okay, I may want to tinker with this, but it's, it's better if I just pull myself back. Yeah, I think, um, you know, a lot of people say wine is made in the vineyard. I don't agree with that. I think, um, you know, we talk about this concept of terroir. Terroir exists, but we have screwed up terroir in two ways. Number one, we irrigate. By irrigating, we have removed terroir because that is not true terroir if we import water to the location that is not natural. That's why I planted a vineyard in southern Chile that's dry farmed. And the wine that you're trying this evening, the Lone Tree, is also dry farmed. So that's true terroir. When you drink that Lone Tree Chardonnay, the Lone Tree Cabernet, that's true terroir. The second example I'll give you is when I worked for Allo de Mec, I, um, I made five winemakers make 10 tons of Cabernet from the same vineyard. And at the end of the year, we all sat down and all five wines tasted completely different. So where is the terroir in that? To me, the terroir is, is the culture of the winemaker, the culture of the, the vineyard manager and, and how we work with the soil and how we work with the wine. You know, that when I consult, the last thing I want to do is fly into Chile and make a a Cabernet from my 15 alcohol that tastes like Cabernet from Napa. That's pointless, you know? So right. we have to preserve the cultural aspects of the place and the people. And, and, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's really cool too. Like working within those constraints. 
and I would imagine, I mean, I want to talk about the videos, talk about the regions in the world. I don't know how on earth you managed or worked 54 different wineries. That's insane. It's absolutely <laughs> insane. There's a question that came up. If you made your first wine in 82 uh, in Australia, and then you were in California in 89, why so quick to California? Why not continue to make wines in Australia and New Zealand? Well, the, the U.S. was the bastion of New World winemaking at the time. Uh, I didn't, you know, yeah, New Zealand, Australia, but I also did a joint in Chile for the first time in 1990. So I was doing Northern Southern Hemisphere, and I've done that for, I've done North South now for 35 years, pretty much, uh, 32 years for people who are counting. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I I, f I just find the whole thing really interesting and dynamic and changing. And I'm always looking for like what the next thing is. Obviously I spent a lot of time up in Okanagan and Canada thinking, you know, I'm up there for a month, over a month, a year now, um, working consulting up there thinking, okay, I'm going to be in the Northern hemisphere. I'm going to do as far North as I can, but you know what? We have droughts in Okanagan too. We have fires in Okanagan. We have frosts in Okanagan. So, where do we go next? Is it Canloops? I mean, Canloops, if you Google Canloops, it's another, um, what, five degrees, uh, three degrees northern latitude than we are in the Okanagan. It's the same thing in Chile and Argentina. So Chile and Argentina, you know, Patagonia is what we call the southern part. Right. Uh, and at my vineyard is in Moyeco. Moyeco is 12 hours south of Santiago, but we can go now to Valdivia, um, working on a project in Valdivia with a, a, uh, I, get, I let the wealthy people go in first, you know, they're the thin end of the, the wedge, and then I come in afterwards and get it all right, you know. So you I try to worry. And spend all the money and then yeah. Come and fix it. <laughs> yeah, let them risk the money first, and then I'll go. Uh, so, you know, and, but when I was in Mendoza three weeks ago, I tried to wine from the 45th parallel. I think that's the – because remember, in the southern hemisphere, you can't grow – grapes as far south as you can north in the northern hemisphere because in the northern hemisphere we have more continental climate whereas in the southern hemisphere all our countries are skinny except for australia you know when you think about chile and argentina it's a relatively skinny continent new zealand is skinny right. south africa is skinny but in canada you know it's a big country in france it's a big country so there's got to be a formula there between altitude latitude sorry latitude distance to the coast um and uh and altitude yeah so yep. it's it's complicated but exciting so we're you know what's next what's new and uh you know so i don't think and, and things are changing and evolving because uh knowledge is getting you know we can get around the world faster we can go to new areas quicker we've got better well theoretically we've got better transportation um yeah, no, it's it's opening up a whole new gamut, and how can we do this with less? The only the only problem is the more north and the more south you go, the yields are just shocking. So instead of you know four or five ton an acre that we can get, you know, in Napa Sonoma, you're talking about three to four ton an acre in these extreme areas, and it's hard to get labour, and the electricity is difficult. You know, so it doesn't come without a cost. Um, right. me, unfortunately. I want to show some folks your videos and it's for, for those of you that are new, we refer to all of our seller angels as heroes because, and I don't mean heroes in the Marvel comic strip standpoint of heroes. I mean, Aristotle, Epictetus, Seneca, and the Stoic standpoint. Hero actually in Greek stands for protector or defender. And our customers, the angels, they are in fact protectors and defenders of the limited production winery. They are helping change the world. They are helping buy these wines uh, helping folks like Nick and helping the small producers because, and that really is hero status. I mean, you, you skip the store, which is great. There's less of a carbon footprint buying direct from the winery. So we're thrilled with having you all as wine heroes. Uh, oftentimes when you attend videos, you can be referred to as a sipster, which I'm sure that Jeff and Jane will be talking to a few sipsters uh, in the chat line. But the videos that I want to talk to you about, Nick, uh, and I, you may, all the folks at home are going to probably have to turn up their volume but bush vine vineyards. Now we're talking about vineyard farming practices and techniques. So if I go here and it worked in rehearsal, this was amazing to me. The rocks in this vineyard are incredible. Some bush vine melbic in 
can't see it. Oh, hang on a second. Mission control says you can't see it. Yeah, I can't see anything. I will remedy that. <laughs> can you see it now? Just checking in. Yes. All right. What I can't hear is the volume. So this is a bush vine vineyard. I'll back up. These are the rocks I was referring to. Okay. Place of the Indies and uh, just checking in on it. Look at that. There's some nice looking mill big. Anyway. <laughs> so, those of us in America and have been to California, we don't see vineyards like this. So, well, is it technique to grow Cabernet Sauvignon like this? Well, that, that vineyard is actually Mel Beck and it's grown at two and a half thousand, um, you know, so in feet, it's about 5,000 feet, very high up in the Andes. You'll notice there's no irrigation there, so it's dry farm. So what we're doing here is we are using very little water and we're keeping the vines very, very small. So we're keeping them uh, in, a, in a sort of round bowl. Now, there is another video, or I, and in fact, I sent a photo. I don't know if you want to pull it up, but a much more vertical situation where we, it's a bush vine, but it's grown on a, um, a, uh, a what we call a goblet, like a, like a goblet, uh, situation. And so that's a vineyard where we have, um, irrigation. Okay. This, this is a looking at a vineyard that's, um, I, I, I sent this photo. This is a really interesting photo because it, this is a uh, hail netting. So as you go further into the Andes, we have hail, granny soil. And um, so this is a way that we protect the, the vines from hail. If you get hail, basically you can strip all the leaves off the vine and damage the clusters. And so most of the vineyards that are highly thought of in Argentina are uh, uh, used and protected in this way. In New Zealand, we... So you'll get hail... At, during harvest when it's 60 70 degrees yeah argentina this is this is an argentina uh you can tell by the shape of the leaf that we're looking at a malbec vineyard there uh this is really dramatic and we have hail every year in argentina now if you looked at the same vineyard in new zealand with um uh the netting it's put there for bird control because the birds eat all the grapes so we use netting for different reasons. And then in California, when you see netting on a vineyard, it's usually for shade cloth. So we're trying to protect the vineyard from uh, excessive sunburn. But basically, it's all the same type of netting. But in this case, we're looking at a vineyard that's um, used for hail control. Well, and the reason why I pulled up this video, and I'll hit play here in a second, is we talk about farming practices, and you get to sometimes plant vineyards yourself. And you have to sometimes buy vineyards and row orientation makes a difference in how you plant the rows. And that's what floored me on this video. So I'll hit play and then get your comments afterwards. It's an interesting situation. This vineyard is planted north, south. We have plenty of crop on the morning side. This is the eastern side. It's not quite north, south, it's just slightly off. But on this side of the vine, we have nothing. And so I was questioning how exposed the buds are to the sunlight that these buds are not producing as much fruit as this side of the vine. Even if we remove the leaves here, it's just not the fruit. We have good canopy. It's been tipped twice. You can see the Andes in the distance. But yeah, just an interesting scenario of morning side versus afternoon side. So morning sun versus afternoon sun. Row orientation <laughs> where the sun is not hitting a certain part of the row impacts fruit production. It's got to drive you nuts. Well, that I in that video, I touched on two really, really important things. One of them I did not, I touched on it, but I didn't go into it, um, which it's always interesting watching your own videos afterwards. Okay, so row orientation. So north-south is ideal, is, is the classic direction because the sun comes from the east, sets in the west. So you get morning sun, afternoon sun. So in the northern hemisphere, the problem is the afternoon sun gets more heat, more heat, more time. So in the northern hemisphere, you plant 15 degrees off north-south. 
and this and so you want to be a little bit more uh south uh west in the northern hemisphere in the southern hemisphere you want to be the 15 degrees the other direction because you know the sun is to the north so you got to plant 15 degrees up does that make sense so the idea is that what the perfect vineyard is august this is northern hemisphere in the northern hemisphere the perfect vineyard on august 15 at 3 p.m has no shadow now in that video you just looked at there's a lot of shadow on the ground which means that either the row orientation is not correct or the um the uh it's taken very late in the day or very early in the day now you can see the shadow is in the middle of the row so that is not ideal so we want no shadow we want the shadow to be completely under the vine the second thing i touched on was the shortage of crop now the reason why that shortage of crop occurred is because on the afternoon side they've been leaving this is the the, the exposed side and this video is morning the problem is the afternoon side they've left the leaves on for so many years that the light has not been able to get to the bud and when the bud does not have any light it becomes less fruitful so that's why there's no fruit on the afternoon side they've been so cautious about sunburn they've lost crop because they can't they can't get enough light onto that canopy interesting and this type of farming is I mean, you have to study it when you are looking at a vineyard to source. Are you asking them? I mean, you can you automatically can see row orientation, so that's your first delta or data point. No, my first and, my first question is always what rootstock are you on. The second question is the row orientation, yeah, because rootstock is really important. And so I thought this was a fascinating video. It's the shorter one, um, and <laughs> well, it's interesting because. This is the Andes and you flying in. Yeah, this is, um, I was flying to Mendoza about three weeks, ago, four weeks ago. I think. In the comment line, you said, I, I don't think I've ever seen in my 32 years of coming to Mendoza so little snow in the Andes. Yeah, and that's, there's two major mountains. There's the Aconcagua and Plata. So that's Plata. Plata is the second highest mountain after the Aconcagua. And normally there is um, uh, glaciers uh, occurring there. And, and there, are, there you can see a tiny little glacier there, but basically the lack of snow is devastating for Argentina. So in Argentina, the water that they gain in Argentina is below ground. So when the snow mounts, it goes through these um, uh, springs and natural res uh, natural water sources whereas in chile when the snow mounts it goes out through the river because remember uh, the andes are much closer to the ocean in chile whereas in argentina uh, we're miles away from the ocean so we rely on snow mount for underground water and then in chile we rely we rely on the rivers um the above surface uh, uh rivers to irrigate our vineyards so having so little snow like that definitely definitely affects argentina less so for chile and apparently i copy and pasted the same video in a different link so we don't get to see the color and the furrows so oh okay that... i sent you um i sent you earlier uh to denise some slides i i could pull it up i could probably share my screen if you want um well oh, look at that the photo shows up straight away was that meant to be? I don't um, know if that was you or Denise. Is that Denise? And then I've got, I've got, no, that's you. Okay. So you can see here, this is an old vineyard um, and this is furrow irrigated. So these vineyards were planted, you know, back when we had lots of water and these vines, this is what we call a pergola system or um, uh anyway these vines are growing super tall i'd never been in this vineyard before and i was really interested in it because the 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 trunks of the vine you can see the trunk of the vine here is very thin and um that's unusual because uh normally in these vineyards you have really thick trunks and really strong vines i don't know if you can just see the the top of the vine there but the canopy on these systems these overhead systems are really interesting because they're very short shoots they have very short shoots and then one cluster per shoot and the clusters generally are really small and the berries are really small because 
because the lack of water, because they only irrigate three times a year. Now, of course, these days we would never think of furrow irrigating because it's a it's an expensive way to irrigate and we lose a lot of water. And especially in this vineyard, you can see they irrigate on both sides, which is also very unusual. Um, and this is all done with horse and plow. It's not done with a tractor, of course, because we've got to get the horses underneath the... We have short Chilean... Uh, I think this vineyard is in Chile. I think it's in Chile. Um, so we have short, short Chilean horses that we can get under the canopy rather than using big tractors. But yeah. It's a really interesting situation and, and something that we probably will see less and less of as we go forward. And so a couple of questions are surfacing with regards to the, the climate change. And, you know, we just talked about the snow melt in the Andes being really, really low this year. And we've talked about it with other winemakers too. You saw Bordeaux adding new varietals to the, the region for the first time. Do you anticipate new grapes being grown or new grapes being grown entirely because of the warming temps or just differently or different regions? All of the above. I, um, maybe less so new varietals. I'll just, uh, we'll probably just have the same varietals, but we'll grow them differently. And as I alluded to earlier, the number one question I always ask when I look at a vineyard is what rootstock is it on? For instance, we used to, when we had back in the, uh, Nine to, up until about 95 we used to plant a rootstock called 10114 another one called 5c these rootstocks are very shallow now we had lots of irrigation so we could irrigate and these vines were really good they produced a lot of fruit but now as the climate gets drier i haven't been planting 10114 since uh as i said 95 i'm planting um uh 110r 1103 polson 3309 uh, Riperia Gloire. These are a lot of these old um, rootstocks that people gave up on. But actually, because because they they get off to a slower start when you plant them, it takes three years to get a crop. But I find those uh, rootstocks far more interesting because they can they're far more drought tolerant. They're much deeper, and so the way we irrigate, like up and you know, we used to irrigate three times a week, five five time five hours three times a week. Now I'm irrigating for eight hours once a week because I want to have much deeper penetration into the soil. And also the way I manipulate the soil is a bit different too. The problem with organics, growing organically, is that, believe it or not, it's actually a little bit less organic than you think. Because the problem when you grow organically is you need to go up and down with the tractor more. Right, you get um, more compaction. Yeah, so you have more compaction. And when you have more compaction, we need to loosen that soil up a little bit more. So uh, more compaction means less water penetration. And so we're doing work with that. Yeah, there, there's a, that machine is, this is state of the art. This is brand new machinery. This is uh, the orange circle there that you see. This piece here is what cuts the weeds. And then this uh, small disc here, very open disc, will follow along right under the tractor tire and actually move the soil backwards and forwards depending on which way you want to go. So this is this is new technology. And I've been looking for something like this because we've had this technology around for some time and it works really well as long as you don't have a stony soil. But a lot of the soils I work on are quite stony. So this is the first machine that's really been developed um, to handle weeds and stony soil. So it's not actually uh, cutting down right on the ground. It actually um, it cuts a little bit higher up. Uh, so quite different. The other the other machine that we've been using up until now is called an interceptor, and what that is is a machine that will come along underneath uh, the soil and tip the soil forward and back and gets rid of the weeds that way. But when you have a stony soil, you're breaking blades. Oh yeah, <laughs> like, crazy. And we don't oh, actually oh, cut the oh. vine. There's a there's a piece on the machine when it hits the vine, the machine goes around the vine. So don't think we're cutting the vine. Um, cool. So yeah. Couple, that, couple other questions. Uh, Don, my mouse stopped working, is asking a question about being heartbroken. But he says that uh, they regularly enjoy the Catherine and the Hillary, as do I, by the way, and has to admit that a lot of unfounded anxiety when he heard you'd sold the Dry Creek Vineyard and would be relocating. Talk a bit about managing the transition and ensuring a high quality wine while transitioning venues. 
No, the um, the transition occurred with um, Catherine. So we had a trademark called Crazy Creek. Um, the Crazy Creek. I never. It's a long. This is this is the problem when you deal with uh, uh, friends <laughs> over a long, long period. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, the owners of Crazy Creek died, and they were very good friends of mine. And the um, how do I put it? The he owned he owned a uh, winery, and that winery is called Delorimier, and Delorimier had the trademark Crazy Creek. Now Delorimier Winery was sold at the at the chap's death and sold to uh, a group called the Wilson family. Now they didn't even make wine from the vineyard, but they owned the trademark. It's really complicated. So they never made wine from the vineyard. I made all the wine from the vineyard, but the trademark Crazy Creek went with the estate. So I still buy, Catherine still comes from the same vineyard. I just had to change the name. And that's why today um, we call it uh, uh, Stone Mason Hill because it's a, it's a hillside and it's, um, it's the same vineyard. I just had to change the name, unfortunately. And you, and you talked about hillside, and we know the first thing you ask about is rootstock. Then you look at row orientation. And then I'm curious, especially given Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, valley floor, hillside, elevations, east facing slope, west facing slopes. What, are you, I, I, I'm sensing a madness, it's, it's quotient here. Um, what are you looking for? And what, what do each of those elements bring to uh, the winemaking and vineyard farming practice yeah. technique, and what does it manifest as? Well, the rootstock is the same thing. You know, I, I want to make sure I've got nice deep roots. They, but the problem is when you farm on a hillside, you can't always plant 15 degrees off north south because often the slopes are too steep, or sometimes you go across the slope, and that's not good for rolling tractors, as we call them, widow makers. Um, so we don't, um, I have to look at the exposure. The other, so the second piece is really, um, I never want to be on the top of the hill. When people say it's uh, the top of the hill, you know, the problem with top of the hill is you have the th soils are really, really thin and generally tend to be really stony. So there's very little water holding capacity and those vines tend to be overexposed. Then you talk about the valley floor. We always used to shy away from the valley floor because it was more vigorous. Now. I believe that you can undercrop a vineyard just as easily as you can overcrop a vineyard. So when I go into a, into a, you know, when I'm in a retail situation or a consumer event, somebody, people always go, you know, how many tons per acre do you get? And I look at them and go, mm. if they don't know too much, I'll say two <laughs> because it sounds better than four, which sounds better than six. So the Valley floor stuff, we used to shy away from because it would give us four to five ton an acre. And in the hillside would give us three to four ton. But now with global warming and lack of water, we want to be on the valley floor because that's where we're getting the three to four ton an acre and the hillsides is only giving us one to two. Now when it's costing right, you, next, sorry? No, I was gonna the, say the next time someone asks you that, how many ton an acre you get, you can just say just enough. Well, I always go, well, how many vines? Because as a winemaker, we talk about kilos per plant. We don't talk, or buds per meter. We don't talk about tons per acre because if I had one vine on an acre and it produced half a ton versus 2,000 vines on an acre. Uh, you know, so your, your kilos per plant is a much more important conversation, but it's a very hard concept to understand. And when you talk imperial measurements rather than metric, it's, it's, even, hard, it's even more complicated. But yeah. Well, speaking of questions, I've got some questions to ask the audience regarding you and some other things. And you actually um, answered this inadvertently, so it'll be interesting. Um, <laughs> When determining if you'll take a winery project, that doesn't mean plant your own winery, but if you're going to work and come in as a consultant, what's the first thing you try to assess? Is it the people behind the project? Is it how special is the vineyard? Or maybe given the number of years you're doing this, you, you, want, to, you want to challenge, you want to be pushed, you want, I, I'm curious, and maybe, maybe none of these, uh, but I, you get consulted around the world in there's got to be something to where, I don't know if you've got a systematic process of, I'm going to check this, 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 and then if everything lines up, I'll take the project, or if it's just good chemistry, gut feel, or all the above. But I'll give folks about another five seconds 
to answer this, uh, maybe it's the, the, it's as simple as can they pay their bills? Uh, I, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> All right, three, two, one. So they believe that the answer is how special is this vineyard? What, what are some of the determining factors for you, Nick, when you are making the assessment of, am I going to take on this project? I think uh, 20 years ago, that would have been the right answer. But today it's all about the people. I, I, um, I want to see the passion in the people's eyes. I want to, this getting into the wine industry is not an easy is not an easy uh, business and you got to be there for the long haul it's um uh the dedication the focus and you know I, i'm not to say like for instance um i, I make a wine called senior some people may have heard of senior so we been it was originally done by the mondavis and the chadwicks and i took over senior in 2005 so from 2005 and, and the highest wine we'd ever scored was 93 points. So between 2005 and today, we've had five wines of a hundred points. Uh, that comes from dedication and focus of the owner. If anyone else had had that business, it was a very expensive business. They would have bailed out and not committed. And I, and I can name a couple of wineries where they got really close. You know, they got really close to the icon, the, the selling wine on Premier, which is really the, the focus, you know, Senior is now sold on Premier. We can talk about that another time. Um, to get to that level takes a hell of a lot of work and a hell of a lot of dedication. And, you know, I'll give you an example. And, and Checkmate, another winery that we that I've started working with in um, Okanagan, Checkmate, we only make Chardonnay and Merlot. And the owner said to me, Nick, it's all yours. You take the reins. That vineyard started in 2012. And today we've had 400 point wines. That's the fastest wow. ability that I've been able to make a hundred point wine ever. And of course <laughs> that comes with its prices too, you know, because now everything's on allocation everyone gets upset and it's a very small production, but, right. but I can name you wineries where they've gone the other way and they've just said, Nick, we, we can't do it anymore. We just can't keep throwing money at this and they're so close, but they pull out. And so the person behind it, uh, is really important. And then for me, I often sit down with the, I always sit down with the winemaker before I take a job because it's always the owner of the, the company that hires me. And I'll sit with the winemaker and say, dude, look, you and I, we're going to know each other longer than you and I are both going to work for this company. But in the future, when I retire, I'm coming to your house. I'm going to drink your wine. I'm going to play with your kids. I'm going to hang out with your wife. I'm going to go to parties with you. So we're going to be friends for a long time. So you have to push me just as much as I'm going to push you. And this, the strive, like an incident the other day, I walked into a winery and they go, Nick, we've got this great idea. We want to do this, this, and this. I said, awesome. How much more money are we going to charge for it? Because they were thinking the opposite. They were thinking we've been so successful with this $50 cabinet. We want to come out with one at 40. I'm like, no, dude, we've got to go the other way. We've got to push it to this. We've got to do a $70 Cabernet, not come down to 40. Like why? Because then the consumer goes, man, I've got this wine and, and suddenly it's not good enough. I have to buy this other one, which is cheaper. You know, right. so it, I don't know. So yeah. people are really important. Yeah. Originally, when I got into the business, 100% correct. I would have just looked at the vineyard and go, damn, I'm really interested in working with that vineyard. But today I really want to, work with the people, learn from the people. And I get to work with, you know, they bring in other consultants, whether they're financial consultants or vineyard consultants. You know, I'm the wine guy, but I have a vineyard background. I'm a wine guy, but I have a little bit of a business background. You know, I'm a wine guy, but I have a bit of a distribution background. So, yeah, I get to meet all amazing people, and that's really what keeps, my, keeps me going, you know. I like it. And I'm going to ask you a trick question, kind of, because if – if Nick wasn't creating wines with people that he liked and having a blast doing it, what would Nick be doing? Raising Iberico pigs in Spain and selling the ham worldwide. <laughs> you might have noticed a guitar or two in the background. Would he be a session jazz musician, <laughs> ski instructor in Tahoe, or a tour guide in Argentina, <laughs> or a ukulele stand-in <laughs> band member? I'd be curious, and I actually don't know the answer to this one. So um, we're going to give this one real quick, and then I've got a bunch of 
question or a question from the audience. Then we're going to do some tasting notes and some Google Earth. So we'll do this five, four, three, two, one. Wow, a lot of people don't believe you like Spanish ham, and apparently your can't... audience is crazy, man. Your audience is crazy. <laughs> I want to be a ski instructor in Tahoe. That's why. That's why I became a winemaker, man. I wanted to sail in the summer and ski in the winter, and um, <laughs> that's funny. You guys are funny. So no, I don't want to be. A, people call me all the time to be a tour guide, though. If you ever want to create a tour out of New Zealand or Argentina or Chile or Australia, call me. I'll set one up. But and I. Um, I've done it a few times now with uh, with people, but uh, yeah, you got to be full on. It's, it's it's a tour, Nick Goldschmidt style. That means getting up at seven o'clock in the morning and getting to bed at midnight. There's nothing in between. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. So there would be. So how did we answer that question? What would you be if you weren't making wine? Ski ski instructor in Tahoe. That was the only option you gave me. I like it. I like it. I like it. The question you talked a little bit earlier about uh, machines. Yeah. See. I, that's where I got the jazz musician. Um, you talked earlier about the machines and the technology, both when you started out and now there's new pieces of equipment that are out there. One of the things that's out there is the optical grape sorters. And do you find that those make better wine or is it, I mean, people have been manually sorting wine or grapes on a shaker table for years or not even on a shaker table. So is there a pro or con to each one better than the other? Well, I think it, with any with anything, technology teaches us something. So, what we learned about grape sorting was that we can sort out raisins and jacks and other pieces of mog uh, material other than grapes out of the uh, out of the the grapes very easily. Um, so, what we learned was that we probably sorted the grapes a little bit too strongly, and the wines weren't as good because the the key thing is about variability. We want to have very, remember the Italians planted Zinfandel, Petit Sero, Grenache, Carignan all in the same vineyard. I mean, that's why we, we had diversity. And then you come down to this monoculture where we have one berry that weighs 0.9 grams and it's 100% black and it has an accurate sugar of, you know, 24 bricks. And then we have this mono wine. So we have to figure out something in between. So the technology now has moved on where we have optical sorters actually on the machine harvesters because i don't know if you know this but we're not going to be able to hand hand pick for very much longer the only vineyards that will be hand picked will be the ones that are uh, on steep hillsides but everything else will have to be mechanized we just don't have the labor there is no labor in the world i'm here in new zealand right now we've got less than two percent unemployment you think anyone's going to pick grapes no in argentina and chile the minimum wage is now 25 bucks an hour you can't get anyone to pick grapes for 12. So mechanization is going to be the way so how do we how do we mechanize without being so accurate that we're decreasing quality and it's not because machines aren't good machines are fantastic we can get the fruit to the winery much quicker we can pick in the middle of the night we don't have the crew stop for lunch you know so we can we have a lot of advantages with machines but i think in some respects we've gone so far to perfection we've got to come back a little bit to have the machines be a little bit less perfect, a little bit more humanized, you know, and and uh, it's it's become a bit of a uh, conversation piece. There's a very famous winery in Napa that was one of the first to uh, to use optical sorters, and uh, they're actually they've mothballed their one. They've gone back to hand sorting uh, in the vineyard. So quite an interesting concept. I had a really long conversation with the winemaker about it, and uh, yeah, that's exactly what he sees as well. Interesting. Uh, good question. Thank you, Peter. I want to show folks kind of where Nick is. Well, not New Zealand, but and I promised Nick, by the way, that we'd spring him at the top of the hour because it's his birthday. So he's going to a birthday party at one o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow. Uh, still, still not able to get over that concept. So uh, yeah. uh, let me know what happens in the I bet you Doug, Doug R would be interested in what happens in the Minnesota game tonight, since you already know the final outcome tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Napa and Sonoma, this is our playground. This is Nick's playground in California. And uh, this is where we focus. Nick has uh, tremendous vineyards in, in both counties and both regions. It's, it's a very unique area as we talk about with regards to um, the Mediterranean climate, the number of soil series that they have, 13 of the 33, all of the uh, 
access and proximity to maritime influences, the rivers. But but Nick, you, as far as the Chardonnay is concerned, the Dutton Ranch Chardonnay, uh, talk a little bit about that property. It's the Singing Tree Vineyard, and I'll zoom in on it right here. Yeah, so um, I, I made a little bit of a mistake, um, Martin. So it's my, my fault completely, everybody. But uh, I didn't realize you were pouring the Dutton. The Dutton Chardonnay actually comes from an area called Green Valley, where uh, Martin has the uh, pin drop. That's my singing tree vineyard. That is my, the, when you go to the store, you should be able to find the singing tree Chardonnay. And that is uh, the vineyard that, um, that he's marked. Now the Dutton Chardonnay comes from about 20 minutes to towards Grayton. Uh, it's a, in Green Valley. It's the coldest, coldest vineyard in um, Sonoma County. This is in the Russian River. Uh, it's actually a sub appellation within the Russian River called Green Valley. And Warren Dutton sold me the grapes in 1990 when I was at Simi. And he's since passed away and I buy the grapes from his sons now. Um, but you'll notice with the wine, uh, I think you're pouring the 2017, which uh, we're actually out of stock on that. We're actually, um, but that's a really unique wine because 17 was really full, fleshy, rich. Now, this is 100% native ferment. There's no yeast. It's 100% um, field selection, Marcel. There's no clones. Like when you drink Chardonnay today, most of the, the Chardonnay you drink is clonal and you'll get white peach and uh, apple. But in a field selection or mass selection, what you're what you're tasting right now, you're going to get a lot more subtropical fruit. You're going to get a little bit of honey, a little bit of nut, a little bit of passion fruit, subtropical melon, those sort of characteristics, and really, really unique wine. Unfortunately, the whole vineyard only produces about 220 cases. So you guys are probably drinking a case tonight, so there's one gone. <laughs> so if you like the wine, it's uh, yeah, very hard to get, very hard to make. I, I started off making it traditional New Ze um, Simi Reserve Chardonnay with 100% new wood, but now it's down to 50% new wood. It's all tight French grain, all Allier, uh, steep hillside wood, uh, forest. And the vineyard itself is a sandy clay loam. It's, it's still planted on AXL1 rootstock, which, as many of you know, uh, had its demise in 1990 when we had a resurgence of phylloxera. And most of those vineyards were replanted, but this was never replanted. It's still on the AXR1 rootstock. So it's a really, really unique wine. I hope you enjoy it. Interesting. Very enjoyable. And now let me, what would you pair with this wine? Oh, for me, for me, like uh, fish, but, you know, with creamy sauces and things like that, because there's enough, but I'd cool the wine down a little bit because it has enough acidity there to, to sort of make your mouth water and go back and have that second glass. And that's sort of what I think about when uh you know a chicken a chicken dish with um but you know any sort of white sauce i think um with it would go really well great uh and now we're going to move on to the cabernet and alexander valley produces some absolutely amazing cabernets and this is pretty far north up there uh compared to where most people go to santa rosa or windsor or healdsburg and you're going quite a bit further and this is an vineyard I, I very special because of its topography but talk to me about a the forefathers and and the, kind of the meaning and philosophy behind that and and then about this wine specifically yeah the forefathers again we're talking about a very limited release wine about 350 to 400 cases in a good year where uh, martin has put the yellow pin there uh if you move up the hill which is to the left that's a pretty steep slope um yeah, you go up. There you go. The, right there. That's the uh, that's the Lone Tree Vineyard right there. So it's dry farmed. The name Forefathers comes from um, uh, it was the first wine that because you know I was making wine around the world and I wanted to you know when you think what's the best Cabernet in the in the New World? Well, you know for me Alexander Valley when best. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Marlborough, Vest, Shiraz, uh, McLaren Vale in Australia, and Best Malbec is Argentina and the Uco Valley. So we had F O R E, not F O U R. But um, so forefathers means the forefather appellation of that variety in the New World. You'll notice on the label that those who have the label in front of them, that's a pair of boots on the label. And um, the boot, those boots I used to wear when I walked around Simi. And then there's faded out writing 
on the label. And that is when I became an American citizen, I decided to take that sort of constitution concept and write my own constitution about my dedication to, uh, at the time, fish friendly farming, sustainability and organics. Um, and then on the bottom of the label, you'll notice that's John Hancock's signature, which I changed to my own. So, <laughs> but that's now become my signature on all my wines. It's pretty funny. It's John Hancock's. So John Hancock's signature is on all of my wines. But um, yeah, that's the Forefathers Lone Tree. Uh, there was, um, and as I said, it's dry farm, tiny little berries, and really, it, it doesn't get a lot of recognition, this wine, because it's sort of at the $50 price point, $55 price point. And more of the attention goes to my Goldschmidt wines, which are far more expensive and even more and, and much highly sought after. But I've always wanted to make Forefathers because it's um, the uh, uh, it's just a really unique vineyard and uh, really special. And it's a vineyard I've been working on now for 32 years. Yeah. See, and, and that's another thing, too. I, I wanted to joke in when at the top of the hour, I said there's no one I'd rather talk about uh, vineyard farming techniques and sourcing and, and how you do this than you because of the amount of time that you've been working some of these vineyards and to be working the same vineyard for 30 plus years is incredible. Uh, so hats off to you and hopefully if you want it, there's 30 more in there for you. I do want to let you know that Jeff and Jane are pairing the Chardonnay with a brown sugar bourbon pork chop with apple pan sauce and they said it's incredible. Apple sauce is a good idea. I've done that before as well. Well done. Good call. Well done. Exactly. Um, I want to make certain I honor my commitment to Nick and that he can get to his party at one o'clock tomorrow, Friday <laughs> or Saturday. It's the craziest thing. I still can't wrap my head around it. And um, not certain what Denise is doing. Mission control <laughs> is... That's, uh, that's, um, uh, so I have five, I have five children. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I often throw that photo up as a, as a, um, as a bit of a joke, you know, during COVID, of course, we had all, we had nine, nine in my bubble. So five kids and two partners plus my wife and I. And so we drank, uh, 1500 bottles of wine in 18 months, <laughs> which is a pretty, you know, well, my theory is. The average white guy only lives to 84 and I'm 60 today. So, you know, I've only got nine and a half thousand bottles to drink. So, um, you know, if I drink a oh, shitty awesome. bottle of wine, it's like throwing a good one against a wall. So Royce on the left, the one pouring wine <laughs> into his mouth, he's a atmospheric scientist. Uh, that's Chelsea. I made, I started making wine with Chelsea when she was uh, 15. And that's where the label comes from. For those who have seen the, ch the, the labels that I make with my daughters, the the label is a headshot i traced around chelsea's head when she was two years old and she colored it in and that's where the label comes from and for a firstborn male faced with their firstborn daughter it's always a tumultuous relationship and but by having this little business together she and i become really close friends and she's a she just finished her master's in biology and she's doing dna sequencing of coronavirus believe it or not uh, Hillary, the one that you can't see, she's a um, she's an organic engineer. Uh, she's uh, finishing her last year at Davis. The one that you can't see her face holding the bottle up, that's Catherine. She's a vet. And the guy on the right is uh, Luke, and he's a winemaker. So, yeah, that's – that's um, they're all science. They've got – so, basically, I have three chemists and two physicists. That's what's going on. But my wife's a lawyer, so none of us can spell, which is pretty funny. <laughs> That is awesome. Uh, that is incredibly impressive. And I am, as a result of that audible that Mission Control called, I'm now over my allotment of time for you, Mr. Goldschmidt. I want to let everybody know that next week is week 95. Uh, SIP episodes are available on the Stellar Angels YouTube channel in case you missed it. Uh, we have Brady Moran next week. And Brady is the marketing director of Red Car Wine, but there will be a special announcement. I agree with you, Delia. Underachievers, the Goldschmidt kids. It's like I'm not. <laughs> They're very expensive. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know what? You know what we used to call those in my high school. Those were the people that ruined the curve. Well, they were the, they were the ones that always on the bell curve with the 98s and 99s, and and all of us on the other side of the bell curve did not like those smart people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but thank God they all drink alcohol because that makes them easier to put up with. And that's why COVID, 
COVID was an amazing period, you know. Like how many of you, who thought I was going to spend two years with five of my adult children? Amazing. It would never have happened any other way thanks to COVID. No, that's a good point. <laughs> there were some blessings in that uh, achievement or that pandemic. Uh, and we got to spend time with all of these lovely folks here this evening on 94 weeks. So it's been incredible. Nick, you are a gentleman, and uh, thank you so much for gracing us with not only the knowledge, I love learning about all the different things that you have to factor into from a vineyard perspective beyond rootstock and as all the decision making that goes into it. Uh, you're a gift and a treasure to the wine industry. And for all the angels out there, thank you for all you do and the support because we can't do this without you. I want until everyone gets back next week, Nick, safe travels to you. Happy birthday. Everyone be good to one another. Cheers. Thank you. See you.